grace. 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 All right, well, it's Palm Sunday, and as I have told you in the past, I really don't know why we celebrate it. Um, you know, the, the actual event was little more than a superficial he hero's welcome by the Jewish community in Jerusalem. It was something the disciples were quite unprepared for in that they would have never expected it. And uh, it, the people who cried out, Hosanna, um, were all too ready to call out, crucify him, just a few days later, this was, there's nothing really victorious about this. This was, and there was nothing triumphant. I have no idea why we call it the triumphant entry. The Bible doesn't use that word, and it wasn't. Uh, there was nothing triumphant about it. It was, it was a week that was riddled with events that caused Jesus deep sorrow. By then, the week, he, he went up on a ledge and, and overlooked Jerusalem and wept over it. Um, so, you know, if you could hold on to that, I'd appreciate it, okay? Um, so he, uh, you know, this was not something that was considered to be, a, by Jesus' viewpoint or by anybody else's, by God's viewpoint, a week of victory. It was a week of, of uh, defeat for Israel, for God's people. Uh, but we call it a triumphant entry just because at least they, they threw down the branches and they acted happy to see him. But, you know, in all reality, uh, it was it was nothing more than something very, 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 very superficial. You know, the weeks leading up to these events had been fraught with threats and dangers to Jesus. Uh, he had made the very public statement, I and my father are one. And this did not meet with the approval of the Jewish religious elite. Um, and was grounds upon which they sought to stone him to death. That was the last time he'd been in Jerusalem, just a few weeks before. That was when they practically drove him out. Well, they did. Um, actually, he walked out from their midst uh, by the supernatural power of God because they would have stoned him to death right then and there. Uh, so these are the kind of people that are saying, hey, welcome, Hosanna. You know, so I mean, you can see how meaningless this was uh, in so many ways. And, and I think that that itself is the biggest lesson that we can learn on Palm Sunday is with what sincerity do you crown him Lord? You know, with what sincerity do you say, welcome King of Kings into my heart? Amen. You know, Jesus escaped from, you know, their induced mob and made himself scarce. Uh, from Jerusalem for a few weeks, hanging out on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, now, the father is is the master, uh, kind of like Terry was saying earlier, like the master, uh, uh, chess uh, master. Uh, he's also the master in setting up illusions, or, I mean, um, illustrations, which only those who have eyes to see and ears to hear can actually comprehend. During this time away is when Lazarus became sick, and Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus about it, now, their hometown was Bethany, which was dangerously close for Jesus to Jerusalem. It's less than two miles away. Um, an account of this is written in John chapter 11. We're going to look at that, John chapter 11, starting verse 1. It says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus, from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. Yeah, there's something, I tell you, there's something about the Gospel of John that is just so personal. Yeah, I can't even imagine the others writing in terms like this. They would have given a very stoic, if not sterile, representation of this. But John is just dripping with relationship, and he connects dots for you. This was the, he didn't just say Lazarus with, with uh, Mary and, and Martha. He gives you a backdrop. Remember, this is the Mary who, who uh, you know, anointed him and wiped his hair with the, uh, his feet with her hair. And, and, and so on. You know, just gives you all these connecting dots that show relationship. You know what I mean? And that's one of the reasons why I so deeply love John. It says, so the sister sent a message to him saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. God, I love that. Not that he was sick, of course, but that, you know, they, I mean, they knew Jesus so well that they knew they, they didn't have to say, John, uh, you know, Lazarus. All they needed to say was the one you love, right? They knew that. And that tells you a lot about the man, Jesus, doesn't it? That he was the kind of guy that when, when you were loved by him, you knew it, right? 
<laughs> you, you know how there's people who, who say, you know, well, I don't know if you love me because you never say it, you know? But Jesus was the kind of guy that if you were loved by him, you knew it, right? And uh, so they said, you know, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not lead to death, but to God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Not by it, but through it. Okay? Now, it would be a mistake to make too many theological statements or draw too many conclusions from this. Uh, a face value uh, take seems to be best and most safe. Uh, key to this is that no reason is given for him being sick. We don't know what caused the sickness. Uh, God certainly doesn't take credit for making him sick. Uh, but the one thing we know for a fact is that God was going to use it to bring glory back on his son. And I guarantee if Lazarus had been given the opportunity to choose, he would have chosen it. You hear what I'm saying? If he, if he had, had given foreknowledge that, you know what, if I were to get sick and die, it would wind up bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, not through the death, but by, by being brought back to life again, then Lazarus would have probably signed up for it. He would have been the first person in line. You know what I mean? Because, because again, this relationship was not just one way. Jesus didn't just love Lazarus. Lazarus deeply loved him. Amen. But, you know, we know that God was going to use it for his glory. And so Jesus' words were that this sickness will not lead to death. In other words, to separation, to destruction. But instead, it's going to lead to God's glory. He didn't say it was caused to make give God glory. He said it's going to lead to that. Hello? It's going to lead to God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Lead and through, right? So verse 5 says, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So there we have it again. I love, again, I like the writing of John. Little details that would have probably been left by out of the other Gospels. But Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Not exactly what you would have expected, which is kind of a theme today. Not exactly what you would have expected. Because he loved him, he didn't run there. Because he loved him, he stayed where he was two more days. <laughs> you know, the world really doesn't have a bag to put any of this in. You know, I, I remember, uh, I'll never forget, uh, I don't know, maybe I might when I when I get to heaven, but I'll never forget in this earth, the uh, the dream that the Lord gave me that one time that was just so, it was it was undoing and crippling in every way when I, I saw the Lord Jesus being flogged and uh, and I made eye contact with him and I was so enraged, I was so angry and I wanted to go out there and, and save him, you know, like, like I'm going to save him, you know, <laughs> but you know, that was what was welling up in my heart and I remember, I can, I can hear him say it, he looked dead at me and he said, don't take this from me. I'll never forget it. And I'm like, you know, and I, it took me weeks to process that, you know. But, you know, I understood a nobility in Jesus that I still long to have in my heart and my life. A desire that, you know, I'm spending myself for my father. This is what I would choose to be doing. Don't take it from me. And so Lazarus, because Jesus loved him, didn't run to him. He stayed where he was for two more days. <laughs> then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? What are you thinking, right? <laughs> Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered. If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. If anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him back up again. Then the disciple said to him, Lord, if he just fell asleep, he'll get better. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. And they thought that he was speaking about just natural sleep. So Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died. 
And I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, because they were convinced if they went to Jerusalem or anywhere near there, they were going to die. They, they're they convinced of it. Uh, verse 17, then Jesus arrived. When he arrived, he found that Lazarus was already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about the about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She believed in him, didn't she? There's a little bit of an accusation there, but at the same time, there was there was faith, wasn't there? Because look at these next words. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Man, what kind of faith are we dealing with in this woman? Amen? I know that even if you ask even now, it's not too late. Amen? Now, you need to know what kind of a miracle that was because according to Jewish tradition, uh, at least by the fourth century after these events in AD, um, I don't know if it was a tradition back then, but it very likely was, that the spirit of a person kind of and their soul kind of hovered around their body for about three days, kind of reorienting themselves to their new existence before they went on. And so in their mind, to raise some from the dead after four days would have been impossible because the spirit was nowhere around, you know. And yet, listen to the words of this woman. Yet even now, four days later, with a body that already stinks and has already begun decaying, I know that if you ask God, nothing would be withheld from you. Man. Amen. So as soon as Martha, uh, uh, let's see, I'm verse 22. Yet even now, I know whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She was a good student. Right? And she believed what she was told. But Jesus said to, him, said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is not an event. It's not a day. It's a person. And I'm standing right in front of you. Right? I am. I don't give. I am the resurrection. And I am the life, the intimacy with God. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this, Martha? She said, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. I tell you what, she was one-upping most of his disciples. But there again, these were relatives who pressed through the barrier of being a relative to the point where they loved him. They, I mean, This was something that could be said about them that couldn't be said about his own mother, about his brothers and sisters, but these people loved him. Amen? And they were good students of Christ. And uh, so he says, uh, she's, uh, she's uh, let's see. Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was come into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. As soon as she heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. I want you to notice the difference here. When Jesus usually went someplace, people were calling for him. But because of the nature of the relationship he had with these two women, he was calling for her. Amen? How wonderful is that? Amen? <laughs> and as soon as she heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw that Mary had got up quickly and went out, so they followed her, supposing that she was going back to the tomb to cry there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, same thing as her sister, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen to their faith. They knew for an absolute fact that Lazarus would have been saved, that healing would have come. Amen. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was intensely moved in his spirit and deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. 
The word here translated as intensely moved in my translation is a mean is a strong display of emotion, which is somewhat difficult to translate. Shuddered, moved with the deepest of emotions is one way that it could be translated. It is a word which in other places has been uh, used to describe a display of indignation, which would seem out of place here unless it was at the manifestation of Satan's kingdom in the death of a man that was loved by Christ. At any rate, this was no passive response from Jesus. Uh, by all intents and purposes, by the intensity of the word that was used here, Jesus, when he saw them crying, was shaken to his core and his physical body shook. He was moved. This is the kind of guy that we're talking about. This is the kind of God that we're talking about. This isn't a God that's far removed from the feelings of our infirmities, but one who, when he is face, face to face with our infirmities, it moves him deeply. Hello? You know, this is the God man who in, in both conditions as God and man loved this man and was personally wounded by his death and by the effects of his death on those who knew and loved Lazarus. How many times do we read in scripture that just before Jesus taught the people and healed their sick, he was first moved with compassion over and over. God is not far away from us not from the feelings of our infirmities, but is deeply moved by them and suffers with us, even as he commands us to do with one another. Isn't he the one that told us, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep? Jesus does the same thing with us. Please understand the depth of this. This is not, this is not some superficial weeping, which was common in that day. You need to understand, in that day, people used to hire mourners to attend uh, uh, a grief-stricken household in times of death and loss. These were essentially people who were paid to cry. Jesus was not being paid to cry. <laughs> Jesus' heart was and is directly tied to both the Father and to humanity. To see the expression on the face of one is to see and understand the heart and the face expression of the other. They love. They love. What a sobering and humbling reality to know that God is moved by what moves us, so long as what moves us is not in itself selfish or superficial. Going on to verse 34, it says, Where have you put him? Jesus asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. And Jesus wept. Thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful. You know, I know that Jesus has shed more than one tear over everyone in this room. It's the truth. Both in both in, in sorrow and in joy, he's wept tears over us. I don't know about you, but that does that's heart healing for me to know that my God is not far away and that he knows me and that he loves me that deeply. Right? So the Jew said, see how he loved him. Like I said earlier, you don't have to wonder if Jesus loves you. If Jesus loves you, it's obvious. See how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who have opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus intensely moved in himself, same word as was before, moved and moved in himself again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the, de the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he already stinks. It's been four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, the glory of God was a, a totally and directly affixed to the resurrection of this man. Well, the same is true with us. We read it last week in Romans 6, right? He said that if we... Uh, uh, that those, those of us who've been uh, put together in the likeness of his death shall certainly be in the likeness of his resurrection, right? Knowing this, that, that, uh, that, um, that, uh, because we've been united together in the likeness of his death, we'll also be in the likeness of his resurrection. I forget the exact wording, but he said that, uh, knowing that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. 
Even so, you and I walk in newness of life by the glory of the Father. And the glory of the Father was about to raise this man from the dead. Amen? He said, didn't I tell them? But, but see, the same thing that causes our resurrection into the image of Christ is the same thing that raised Lazarus from the dead. And that is, he said, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? It's conditional. If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. He's already talked to God about this, hasn't he? he is, this isn't the first time he's talking to God about Lazarus. It's very likely that Jesus talked to God about Lazarus before he ever heard the news. More than likely, the Holy Spirit told Jesus that this news was coming. And he knew, therefore, how to respond when the news came. He was a human being, make no mistake. He could have responded in the flesh just like you and I could. But instead, he was a, he was a mature son of God who was always led by the Spirit. Isn't that what we read last week in Romans 8, right? It says, those who are habitually led by the Spirit of God, these are the mature sons of God. That word huios is the only word that was ever used for Jesus in his relationship with God. He was a mature son. So he was always led by the Spirit of God, right? So he'd already talked about pa to Papa about this. Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd that is standing here, I'm saying this so that they may believe that you sent me. Notice how everything that Jesus did was in order to encourage and foster faith. Wasn't it? And, and we see that it did that very thing. Indeed, uh, you know, uh, it had that effect since it was at least in part due to this resurrection of Lazarus that the triumphant entry even happened. And we're going to read that in a little while. Verse 43 says, After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. But some of them went back to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and said, What are we going to do since this man does these many signs? If we let him continue in this way, everybody will believe in him. Then the Romans will come and remove our place and our nation. Boy, how dark can darkness get? One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You all know nothing at all. You are not considering that it is to your advantage that the one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. So from that day forward, they plotted to kill him. Even though they heard the word of the Lord, their response was to try to kill him. The Jewish Passover was near, and many went up to Jerusalem from the country to purify themselves before the Passover. They were looking for Jesus and asking one another as they stood in the temple complex, What do you think? Won't he come to the festival? Will he? The chief priests and the Pharisees had orders that had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it so that they could arrest him. So this was what Jesus had to look forward to, right? And this is why he had been staying away for a while. Now, after Jesus had prayed, like I said, he yelled loudly, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out, bound hand and foot with death cloths. And Jesus commanded them, loose him and let him go. You know, you couldn't get a clear pre-illustration of the next week. The week of passion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and his church so that this historical happening in the life of Jesus kind of pre-illustrated what was about to happen. It was shortly following this event that Jesus prepared to enter Jerusalem again the week of his crucifixion. Now remember I told you that the resurrection of Lazarus was one of the major reasons why the triumphant entry even happened in the first place. And now let's look at John chapter 12 
uh, which, uh, which tells us something about this. John chapter 12, starting in verse 9, it says, Now a large crowd of Judeans learned that Jesus was there, meaning in Jerusalem. And so they not only and so they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. They were eager to see some guy that had been resurrected, right? And also I want you to notice Lazarus was with him. I don't imagine that for that day forward, there were too many days Lazarus wasn't hanging around, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And uh, it says, who had, they, Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to kill Lazarus too. For on account of him, many of the Jewish people from Jerusalem were going away and believing in Jesus. God, I tell you what, I wouldn't want to be participating in their judgment, judgment day. Verse 17 and 18, skip on down. It says, meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with Jesus when he called, to, uh, called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. So the crowd met him because with the, with the palm branches, they cried out, Hosanna, come now, Lord, and save, because they'd heard about this miracle. Now turn with me to Mark chapter 11, and we'll begin reading from verse 1. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered, to, entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside the street, and they loosened it. But some of those who stood by there said to said to them, "Why are you doing? What are you doing, loosing the colt?" And they said to them, "Just as Jesus had demanded." So they let him go, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, this was in fulfillment to the prophecy that's been found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, that's the reason why the palm branches, by the way, because palm branches were a sign of victory. And, of course, like I said, Zechariah 9, 9 says, uh, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Right? So this was a, a sign of, 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 of victory. Now, Matthew and Mark, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke, add to this account by recording, and I'm in, in sequence. He said in Matthew 12, 21, um, 10 and 11, it says, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken, saying, who is this? And the crowds kept saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Luke said in chapter 19, verse 39 and 40, some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, restrain their enthusiasm, right? He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones themselves would cry out. Now, earlier this past year, we learned that this whole event had been predicted by Daniel. You remember that? In his well-known prophetic revelation, often referred to by the 70 weeks of Daniel. Uh, we covered it in, uh, in uh, much of it at least, in uh, four messages. One, uh, they were entitled, 70 weeks have been determined for your people, part one and two. Gabriel's enigma and the father's love. And the final week of Daniel's prophecy. All four of those deal with that. And I've got them linked here in case you want to follow up and remember those things. But you remember that Gabriel told Daniel... Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, the Prince, there shall be seventy. I'm sorry, seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. So we had seven weeks plus sixty-two weeks, making sixty-nine weeks. Of course, the weeks 
uh, were weeks of years. So, uh, 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 because the word weeks means seven, so it's seven times this number of years. So seven sets of sixty-two. I'm sorry, seven sets of sixty-nine years, making four hundred and eighty-three years. The final week, or the seven last years of making up the seventy years of Daniel, of course, isn't until the week of tri- the, the seven years of tribulation. Now we discovered that there were a total of four similar commands. Remember, to go restore or rebuild. The first three were to rebuild the temple, and the last one is the final one that actually fit the bill of what Gabriel said, and that was the command to go restore and rebuild the actual city of Jerusalem, right? Now, this happened on March 14th, 445 BC by the command of Artaxerxes I and was given to Nehemiah, and it's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. So we had to begin our counting with 445 BC. Now, I will not go back through that and all those numbers and the deciphering of the calendars and all that, And but I'll link that again, like I said, on the website to spark your memory should you want to look at it because it is really quite remarkable what God did. But suffice it to say that the result was unanticipated. The 69th week landed on April 6th, 32 A.D., on the very day of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The day in which Jesus was finally, if not temporarily and superficially, proclaimed as Messiah and King before he was crucified, which is why it called him Messiah the Prince, right? Before this, no one was calling him King, right? Only here they were. And of course, at the end of the week, they, they mocked him calling him King. So this was the only week he was recognized as King of the Jews. Now, this is in keeping with Gabriel's words to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. It says, So now, so no one understand from the issuing of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, a prince, arrives, there will be a period of seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will again be built with plaza and moat, but in distressful times. And after 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. So the first seven weeks were until Jerusalem was built. That was the, the time period for that, 49 years. But, and then began the countdown of 62 weeks or 443 years until Messiah would be declared prince or ruler or king. Then Gabriel said that after the 62 weeks, meaning after the triumphant entry, the anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. This sounds like the way Isaiah worded it when he said he was cut off from the land of the living, Right? The Old Testament was replete with messianic predictions, which Jews largely misinterpreted. They only pretend, they only partially read the words of Isaiah and Daniel, focusing on those portions where the Messiah was supposed to usher in an everlasting kingdom, because they liked that part. The parts they didn't like, they didn't like. But the parts they liked, they liked. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know? They believed that would happen at the close of these 69 weeks, which very likely also played at least a small, if not a central role in the celebration of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem itself. However, the understanding, they understood the words of the prophets uh, in, in a way that the prophet didn't mean it. They, they did not have eyes to see or ears to hear what God was really saying to them. You know, we look at them and we wonder, how is it possible that they could have missed what was right before their eyes? But truth be told, we might as well uh, ask, what is it that causes any and all of us to be blind to the meaning of God's words? You know, in a word, I believe it's selfishness. Something we have been discussing recently and uh, that we have to suffer a death to, right? Selfishness. We have our own desires and objectives and so when the only one whose words could make a real and lasting difference speaks, we interpret his words through a filter which allows us to see and hear what we want to see and hear. They knew the prophet Daniel had prophesied about the Messiah, but they didn't have eyes nor ears to hear, eyes to see or ears to hear everything Daniel said about him, only the portions which catered to their desires. Daniel did in fact speak of the Messiah setting up an everlasting kingdom. However, the everlasting kingdom spoken of by Daniel could not be a natural kingdom, for in a natural kingdom, the king spoken of would have had to physically live forever and never die. 
Daniel 7, 14 says, then he, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. The one who was to rule the kingdom was Messiah. And yet Daniel also said in chapter 9 that he would be cut off meaning he would be killed in the 69th week. See, that part they didn't pay attention to. They just paid attention to the everlasting kingdom part, not the part of it being cut off, right? Isaiah also predicted that Messiah would be oppressed and afflicted, yet he would not open out, up his mouth. He was to be led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears, he would be silent, so they would not open his mouth. He was going to be taken from prison and from judgment, and be cut off from the land of the living, using Daniel's own words. For the, for the transgression of Israel, he was to be stricken. They also knew that he was to make his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. They knew all these things. It was right there in Isaiah. And if Israel had had eyes to see and ears to hear, they would have known that Messiah had to die and was not here to establish a natural kingdom first, but a theocracy through, with, without national boundaries. Right? In other words, he was coming to rule and reign the hearts of all who would humble themselves under his reigns. Jew and Jews and Gentiles alike across the entire globe. Remember the Bible also told us in Isaiah and other places talked about the Gentiles would come to the brightness of his rising, right? All of this was predicted. They didn't have an excuse for not knowing. It was written right there. So we can see that, you know, nearly the entire nation of Israel missed their day of visitation because of their false expectations regarding Messiah. For though they had been, uh, they, they began the week by crying out, come now, Lord, and save. By midweek or later on, the same people were so disillusioned by him, so disappointed in him, that they were crying out, crucify him. They believed him worthy of death. Ironically, for all the wrong reasons, they were right. He was worthy to die. <clears throat> Jesus was the only human since Adam before his fall who was worthy to die a sacrificial death for all mankind that they might live through the judgment of death pronounced upon him. So they were right. He was worth, he was, he was worth dying. It was right that he died. But they believed that for all the wrong reasons. Now, as, as we wrap up, I, I, I want to close this out with my, 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 really my only take I ever seem to have on, on, I tried really hard, but I just can't find anything else in this, in Palm Sunday. But the fact that we have to reconcile our heart to the real Jesus rather than the Jesus that we, we make up, the fictitious Jesus, the Jesus of our imaginings. What we expect of him and what he is is often very different. And, you know, we say that we love him, but the question is, do we love him enough to see him for who he really is? Amen? And embrace him for who he is. Because that's a, you can see how that's a very uh, apropos question for the Jews back then. You say he's king, but are you going to love him for who he really is? Well, by the end of the week, we see that they were not at all. That they hated him. They despised him. They thought he was worthy of death. Right? Well, you know, I, you know, I wonder, I have to ask myself the same questions. If Scripture is going to have an impact on me or on you, I have to ask myself, how would I respond? How do I respond? I might cry, not cry out, crucify him. But, you know, at the same time, am I really embracing the real Jesus for who he really is? Or am I bringing unrealistic expectations that blind me from seeing who he really is? You know, let, let's not just piously witness the, dis, the disbelief and the disillusionment of his early followers. Let's jump right into the fray with them and walk where they walk. Let's use our filtered eyes to missee and misinterpret some of the very same things that they saw and they experienced and, and see where our devotion stacks up on Easter Sunday. Right? Let's put ourselves under the fine-tooth comb of examination and see where we stack up after this week. Amen? That's what I'm inviting you into. A week of this. Examining him. Examining yourself. Am I really hungry for who Jesus really is? Could he say something that would offend me so much that I might walk away? 
right? Don't think anybody's above it. No one's above it. Paul even recognized that he wasn't above it, right? So, you know, that requires all the more greater humility out of us, amen? And then all the more diligence to love him for who he really is. Yes, Doris, you had something. I wonder sometimes if if we put our place put ourselves in the place of Barabbas. We yeah. released I don't mm-hmm. think Barabbas you know, mm-hmm. stayed around to see the crucifixion. Yeah. I have to think. Yeah. But if he had, you know, there might have been a question of well, I was supposed to be here. Yeah, that's right. It's very possible he did. You know, I I certainly hope he came to the end of himself, right? Now, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, we, as you do this, this week, it's kind of like going down the Via de la Rosa with him, you know, the way of suffering. You know, we have it on good record that all who come Jesus's way will both suffer and stumble. What did these Israelites see in that week that turned them so cold from their shouts of Hosanna? What they saw in that week was someone entirely different than they expected and so one, and so someone entirely different than they wanted. In that week, they saw Jesus enter the temple and drove out the money changers for a second time. He taught some incredibly unpopular parables. His authority was challenged. He encouraged them to pay taxes to Caesar, which, as you can imagine, was a huge hit. He confirmed his belief in the resurrection of the dead, which made him unpopular with the Sadducees and those who followed him. He warned people about the scribes, which undoubtedly upset the scribes. He put the Pharisees in their place a few times, making them even more making, making him even more unpopular with them than he already was. He even pronounced seven woes on the Pharisees. He foretold the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, also not very popular. He spoke about the coming of the Son of Man, which is who he was, but this would have confused them because they didn't see a second coming, only a first one. Then he again foretold his own death and that it would be by crucifixion, which according to the law would make him cursed by God. He's getting more and more unpopular by the moment. He was a Jesus they weren't expecting. He was a Messiah they didn't want. All of this conspired together to reveal a different Jesus than the way when they thought they had honored and shouted Hosanna to at the beginning of the week. The conflict, the conflict between the Jesus they expected and the Jesus they encountered was profound. That disillusionment ran so deep within them, but by week's end they wanted this man dead. So as you know, I have you know this way about me where I have to put myself in their shoes and, and work myself through it. So how is Jesus different in reality than my expectations of him? And I invite you to ask yourself the same thing this week. You know, it's an important question to ask, you know. And it's in step with where the Lord's been leading us this whole uh, since the beginning of the year in our pursuit of knowing Jesus relationally. Whatever your answer winds up being to the question, it is also that that is keeping you from truly and completely knowing, following, and conforming yourself to him. Isaiah told us that all who come his way will stumble by saying in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those, uh, sorry, to both the house, houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We're not alone in our uh, in our our ability to be offended at Jesus and be disillusioned by Jesus. Even the disciples, it, ex- it happened to them. And I think that in the one example I, I really love, and I'm going to draw upon in closing, and I've done this before, but I just can't improve upon it because I think it's such a good, a great visual for us. Uh, Peter was perhaps the most profound example, you know. Peter had just recently received the revelation from the Father that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. It wasn't that long ago in relation to these events. Later, Jesus told him that he, that he was going to die, for which, Jesus, uh, for which G, uh, Peter pulled Jesus aside and rebuked him. Now, Peter had just gotten the revelation that this guy's the Son of God, And then when Jesus said, I'm going to die, he pulls him aside and rebukes the Son of God. How fickle are we? Right? Later, Jesus told them, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Jesus upped the ante. 
And he began to set before them in clear sight things that would challenge their loyalty to him. It's almost like he did it on purpose. He told them that they would have to eat his flesh and drink his blood if they were ever to have any part with him. They were offended, as were a great majority of those who had been following Jesus, who also left him that day never follow, to follow him again. Now, here's another unexpected thing from Jesus. Rather than turning to his disciples and saying, now, wait a minute, guys, wait a minute, boys, before you turn around to, you know, turn away to, let me give you some good reasons to stick around. No. He actually turns to his disciples and asks them, point blank, do you want to go too? That's unexpected. I wasn't expecting him to ask that question. Was it a question of, where's your faith? In a matter of speaking, yeah. Now, you know, you know I just, a lot of these things, you know, I just didn't see coming. You know, for, for the life of me, I can't see modern pastors asking that question. Do you want to go too? <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that happening much, you know. But, you know, far from encouraging them to follow, he was challenging them about whether they were going to stay. Then in the upper room, Jesus girds himself with a towel and takes a basin filled with water, lowers himself to his knees before his disciples' feet and begins to wash them. Again, not expected. You know? You could tell they weren't expecting it by the way they responded. Especially Peter. <laughs> you gotta love Peter. I was telling Terry last night, out of all the disciples, the two that I, I, I love the most in, in many respects are Peter and Nathaniel. And, and the reason is because they 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 had the tenacity in them to think and to say the things that other people would only think. You know? Nathaniel was the one person, I, I, this has always made me want to meet him. The only person Jesus ever said, behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Wow. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? How amazing, how awesome. Well, a man having no deceit also can't be a person that, uh, that, uh, that hides the truth. If he had doubts, he would have said it. If he wondered, he would have asked. He wasn't filled with deceit. He wasn't superficial. I love that about Nathaniel. You don't know much about the man. You hear almost nothing about him. But the fact that he was a man in whom there was no deceit intrigues me to no end. I want to know this guy. I want to be like that guy, right? You know what I mean? And Peter, for all of his bumbling around and his and his, his putting his foot in his mouth, the one thing you can say is he, he was genuine. He said what he believed he thought was true. You know what I mean? And he was passionate. That's one of the reasons why I'm sure God chose him is because he was passionate. Even when he was wrong, he was at least passionately wrong. You know what I mean? Everything about him was sincere. So Jesus lowers himself and begins to wash their feet. And you know the story. Peter protests and Jesus says, if you don't let me wash your feet again, you can have no part with me. Challenging him. Do you love me enough to press through your discomfort and me shattering your expectations to let me wash your feet? To be willing, if necessary, to drink my flesh, I uh, drink my blood and, and eat my flesh. To have part with me. Then he tells them that they will all forsake him. One would deny him and one would betray him. Again, Peter boldly, somewhat proudly proclaims, though all of these other guys might forsake you, I would die with you. Now Jesus turns and looks into Peter's eyes with that penetrating gaze of his and confirms that his denial will be so complete that he will claim to never have met Jesus. Man, Peter had no bag to put this in. Didn't Jesus know him better than that? Didn't Jesus really, did Jesus believe really so little in him as to assume that he would ever or could ever deny him? That had to be going what was going through Peter's mind. I thought we were tight. I thought you knew me. You know I would never, Peter didn't say that not believing it. He believed it. He believed he would die with Jesus before he would ever deny knowing him. He really believed it. How little he knew himself. You know, again, 
This is our week that you and I are going into, the Via Della Rosa, the, Rosa, the way of suffering. We need to know ourselves better. And you need to know that Jesus is willing to reveal those things about you. He's willing to uncover those things. Did Jesus uncover this to Peter to hurt him? No. No. He was trying to give him an opportunity not to stumble. Right after this, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't they? Right? And he said, pray so that you do not enter into temptation. Right? What did they do? They fell asleep. What did Jesus say? He was angry at them? No, no, no. He said, I can see that your spirit's willing, but your flesh is so weak. Right? That's what's got to be crucified. Because, you know, even though it's weak, it's weak in that it caves in. It's strong in that it always seems to win. Right? <clears throat> and so it's got to be, it's got to be crucified. crucified. It's got to be repudiated. It's got to be brought to the cross. So Peter had no bag to put any of this in. Now, of course, we know what he did. But, he, but what caused Peter to fall after such confidence that he would be willing to die with him? You know, was it simply pride? I don't think that that's really enough. I don't think that's accurate. You know, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, pride was there. That's kind of obvious. But I don't think, and I think it played a part, but I actually believe it was something far more subtle than that. And therefore something we're all prone to. I, I believe that his denial was birthed from wrong expectations of Jesus due to having eyes that didn't see and ears who didn't hear who Jesus really was. In the, up to this moment, Jesus was almost superhuman, you know? He was the teacher that no one could best. No one could outsmart him in a discussion. No one could corner them, corner him with his argu their arguments. And they couldn't even lay their hands on him to kill him, though they tried before, even recently, you know? But that night in the garden, G Peter encountered a Jesus that he didn't expect. A Jesus who could be taken away by sword and carried off to judgment. He didn't see that coming. That's a Jesus he didn't expect. And he was offended at it. You know, it's easy to say, Lord, I'll die with you, when you truly in your heart of hearts believe that could never happen. But what about when they haul him off and nail him to a tree? Where's our faith and our undying devotion then? I mean, what do you do with a Jesus like that? It's too easy for you and I to say, well, you know, I would die with him because you and I know the story. We've already been through the resurrection. We know how it turned out, but Peter didn't have that. And so you need to understand that uh, it will be in just the same type of scenario where you're likely to fall as well. Well. It's not going to be in the story you know. It's in the story you don't know. The sacred, protected, and guarded Jesus of our imaginings will never challenge us. But none of us are safe against the Jesus against being offended and disillusioned by the real Jesus. At points in your journey with him, he reveals himself to not be what you expected. And that is something all true lovers of God have to, have to encounter. And that is the real message today. Jesus entered Jerusalem, a fair weather hero, a superficially honored king. He excited Jerusalem, but then he exited Jerusalem to die. He reentered it to reign. The question is, will I let him? Will we let him? You know, we love him, will we love, but will we love him and long for him enough to do as Paul said and pursue the knowing of him even in the fellowship of his sufferings, even at the point of being conformed to his death so that we might reach true spiritual maturity into his likeness? I believe we will, but I, but I also believe that between then and now will be for us much like it was for them between the triumphant entry and the resurrection. There's going to be times in this journey which will demand that our desire of him be escalated into a passion, passionate requiring of him. He is our life. You know, a foreshadowing of next week, 
I'm going to read you in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Keep thinking about things above, not things on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The key words are pursue and hidden. It's those hidden things right there where you got run the chance of being offended because it's in those things that you don't know about him. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. The things which will offend you about Christ are not plain and open to the sight of casual passers-by. They're hidden with Christ in God or in Christ, in Christ with God. And that is where your life will be found as well. Now, um, I toyed with it. I, I wasn't sure, but I think I will. I'm going to close out by playing a song for you. Uh, and it, it's in keeping with, uh, with the story that, that was a central story that we read today, not the